Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's online community forum. My name is Pamela Duncan. I go by the name of Pam and I am the president and CEO of Metropolitan Development Council. I'm joined here this evening as always by Twina Nobles, president and CEO of the Tacoma Urban League with whom we are partnering for the the series of conversations. Thank you, Pam and everyone. Welcome tonight. Our conversation tonight is the 20th in a series of discussions where we are diving into the different ways that COVID-19 is impacting Tacoma and Pierce County. Tonight, we have a discussion about how COVID-19 impacts housing, including the current eviction moratoriums in place in Washington and across the US and sources of assistance that can help people stay in their housing throughout this difficult time. And tonight, our guests are Linda Taylor, Vice President of Housing and Financial Empowerment for the Urban League of Metropolitan Seattle, who is also partnering with Tacoma Urban League to provide mortgage assistance. Marilise Hood Kwan, Executive Director of the Center for Dialogue and Resolution. Walter Washington with Wellspring Family Services. Corbett Mosley from Metropolitan Development Council. He is a Deputy Program Director of Asset Development and Care Management. So we have a great show tonight. And I wanna thank you all for joining us. And as a reminder, we will be here for the community throughout the COVID-19 crisis with new conversations with a purpose every Monday evening at 5 p.m. The most important message throughout this series of conversations is that there is hope for our community. Our focus is to create space in each meeting to talk about resources and things that we all can be doing to help get us through this pandemic. We would like to take a moment to acknowledge that this meeting is being conducted on the indigenous lands of the Puyallup people. We gratefully acknowledge that we rest on the traditional lands of the Puyallup people where they make their home and speak the Lushushi language. Forgive me if I mispronounce that. Throughout today's conversation, you could submit questions to be addressed by our speakers using a question and answer function in Zoom. We cannot promise that we will have time to consider every question, but we will make our best effort to get through the list in our allotted time. And as a housekeeping matter, and for the security of everyone on this call, everyone's mic has been muted, and we are not allowing everyone to show their faces on the video, only the panelists and the moderator. We have also disabled the chat function, so please submit your questions to our moderator through the Q&A function. And I will get us started with our questions and just a real quick check in um, to get us started. I just want to uh, just see how everyone is doing today, given everything that we've gone through this year. And I would, um, I'm going to go in the order of how you are appearing on my screen. So it'll be Mira Lise, then Linda Corbett, and then Walter. Can you rephrase the question? Now we've got the order. What is your question? <laughs> My question is just simply, how are you all doing today? I show up ecstatic to be on this side of Straight Talk. I've watched a couple of them, so I'm really excited. I also show up with pretty limited lung capacity. I'm not sure if everyone is aware that the smoke really does damage to lungs. And I want everyone to be aware that the smoke may come back this week. So think of those who are vulnerable in this setting and it's something to consider, but I'm giving thanks that I'm breathing better today than I was yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. And Linda. Linda, I'm Linda Taylor, and I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to partner with the Tacoma Urban League. It's something we've been trying to do 
for years, and now we have a, two CEOs that uh, really want to partner and, and partner honestly. So we're, I'm just really, really happy and happy to be able to bring the expertise of the Seattle Urban League to Tacoma to train people that actually live and work in Tacoma. So that's a little different. Usually we send our staff to, to do the work. And this time we're training Tacoma staff to do the work. So we're real happy about that. So I feel good. I, I don't let them steal my joy. I feel great. Thank you. And welcome. Thank welcome. you. Uh, Corbett, I am, um, it was my turn, right? I think so. Um, I, I feel good. Um, we're making it through um, uh, my son, my youngest son going through school and getting acclimated to uh, the online learning environment. And he's kind of picking up what he needs to do. Um, it's kind of cool to have him across the table from me um, during the day when I'm working and he's working. Um, he hasn't asked me a bunch of questions yet, which I, I'm trying to ask him more and pull, tease things out of what he's what he's learning but uh i can track the progress and so um um it's uh it's it's neat to kind of um uh have him around and learning as i'm learning about things myself so i feel pretty good and i think we're getting a uh, hang of it about what to do during this time thank you for joining us there's some chance i'm up next and I'm um, thrilled to be here, um, Walter Washington, with my MGC partners, certainly Merlis and uh, Pam, and of course the work I've been doing with Twina, Twana for some time now. Um, super excited. Um, I feel fortunate because um, there's a lot of folks who are suffering, and um, I'm sitting here in a house that can accommodate myself, my wife, and my two children. A lot of folks don't have that same benefit. Um, sitting inside without AC, smoke outside, COVID's happening, playgrounds are closed, um, you know, movie theaters are closed, malls are uh, very limited. Um, we're just really fortunate to have the stuff that we have. So I think that's a good way to kind of start a conversation, acknowledging how fortunate we all are in the context that we're having this conversation with the technology to, to make it happen and with this camaraderie, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you and thank you. I am thanking all of you for making the time to uh, participate in this session this evening and welcome. Okay, Twina, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And um, I appreciate hearing a quick check in and how you all are doing. I am personally hanging in there and would love for us to take a moment of silence for Mayor Harold Moss, whom we last last week. If you all will join me in a quick moment of silence. Thank you. As we launch into these questions and start to focus on housing and only, um, I can't help but to think the legacy of, of Mayor Moss um, and the work that he did in founding Tacoma Urban League in partnership with uh, Mr. Thomas Dixon. And so I'm grateful that 52 years later, Tacoma Urban League is still carrying out um, its mission here in our community in partnership with all of your organizations. So I would love to set the stage for this conversation. Tonight, we're gonna focus on how COVID-19 and income um, have been um, and how incomes are impacted by the pandemic, how these impacts are weighing on housing for people across our country, our region and state. We know from recent census data and from a weekly pulse report in mid-September that across Washington, roughly 18% of those surveyed said they had little to no confidence in being able to pay their rent at the end of September. Washington's eviction moratorium is set to expire on October 15th and so this question is for each of you that would like to answer. How concerned are you about the potential for a surge in evictions this fall and winter? Are we, I'm talking about question go. Go ahead, Linda. I'm generally talking about mortgage evictions versus rent, rental type evictions and our mortgage evictions aren't set to expire until next year 
when the CARES money is over. That's our concern. Thank you. Because the CARES money expires at the end of the year. So we're training people now and um, we'll be looking for additional dollars to keep them on. Mortgages. Thank you. I'll, I'll jump in. This is, this is Corbett. Um, I am very concerned. Um, and, and here's why. Um, before COVID, one in, in three households in Pierce County, we know, struggled to pay their bills despite working hard. Um, despite hitting the alarm clock every day, they struggled to pay for things related to housing and, you know, uh, just food, putting food on the table, all of those things. Um, after COVID, we, and, and, and we knew that there was a big disparity and a gap there that was a racial component um, in terms of the, the gap between white households and, and, and black households. Um, it is un, it, there's no doubt in my mind that, that this is a, a wave of, of, of um, uh, big instability that is, that is coming our way. Um, and uh, we don't have the resources to adequately respond to the evictions that, that will, um, uh, will be in the pipeline. Um, and, and it scares me. And, and it's um, something that I think that we really need to kind of take um, some time to figure out what our response is. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and I think that the, the numbers are there from every partner that we're talking to, from, um, from the governor's task force, uh, the MDC is a part of, uh, from different community organizations, um, kind of paying attention to the resources that are being allocated to respond to rental assistance, thinking about the kinds of um, the families that aren't able to pay their rent. Um, at this time, it, it's a significant amount. And we don't have the resources to cover uh, what the, the need is. So uh, I'm definitely concerned. And I think that um, we need to spend a lot more time on thinking about what our response is going to be and how we, um, how we can come together as a community to respond to it. I have been worried about this since March but I'm not worried about the evictions. I'm worried about the fact that our community looks at this as if individually each of us have to solve our own housing problem, our own employment problem. And yet when we look at what Corbett just gave us, what we all know is true and you all have been talking about for the 20 sessions is the disproportionality. So if the system is making sure some people do not have access, then we need to have a systemic approach to the actual fact that the majority of our population doesn't have a job, or if they did have a job before, they're having to multiply multiple jobs. The eviction is just a sign of key basic needs that are not being met in our community. And so I feel that the group of people who watch and listen to Straight Talk, that the organizations that are present right here have the capacity to actually consider resources are above and beyond the limited cash that the federal government, that makes it through the county government, that makes it in our cities, that we've got to look at how can we lean in to some of the solidarity and generosity that happens in the case of a crisis like Katrina and yet apply it to our community. So um, I'm here pretty much today singing the song of can we as a community commit to homefulness which starts with understanding our basic needs and figuring out how can we spread what limited resources they are to the maximum number of people and also give people the capacity to resolve their own issues whenever possible. The eviction happening in October has me particularly nervous because we're thinking we can solve it with three months rent, which is the rental assistance that we talk about it going to tenants, but it's going to landlords. Our landlords going to be able to pay their mortgage payments, which brings in Linda with her mortgage issues. Our landlords going to continue to invest in affordable housing when they think so difficult. We've got to have a much more systemic approach. And I think people like the people who put this together really have the capacity. So that's my sense of hope. But I am extremely nervous and have been for months and glad people are talking about it. Mary Elise, this is Linda again. I don't think we have the capacity. 
we don't have the dollars to pay staff to assist people as we should. We have CARES dollars that are going to run out in December. Beyond that, people are still going to be in need and we will have people that are trained up and uh, no resources to pay them. But that's, that's a huge part of our capacity issue. I have some thoughts on that, but I want to make sure Walter gets to participate. So I'm right, to I see Walter's back. doing the rental. Where are you, Walter? Yeah, and I want to apologize. It seems like I've got an unstable internet uh, situation happening here. So excuse me, there's some chance that you're going to be a phone in a moment. Um, there's a whole lot to say about this. I came into January 1st of this year very concerned about this. This is pre-COVID. And I thought at that point in time that we weren't thinking ambitious enough in terms of a multi-generational approach. And I'm thinking about the next generation. I heard my brother Corbett talking about his son um, there, you know, studying with him in the same room in the same area. And I'm thinking about that generation, all the plans we put into place to support the next generation that are now gonna be really, if I'm really pessimistic about how we support that next generation, what we can pass on. All this conversation has been centered a lot around, to Linda's point earlier, around rental control and rent, but we need to get to home ownership. And that's how we're gonna really impact this generational approach to poverty, to housing justice, is home ownership. But I think this, for us, it kind of keeps us in this conversation just about rent. How do you make the rent? And it's not ambitious enough. And we need to be able to license ourselves to think about that next generation ownership and how we really move the dial, not just how we pay the rent at the end of October. So I'm, I am super concerned. I am, you know, it's keeping me up at night and we need us who are doing this work to be at, at our best. And that's so difficult to do because we all have things we're dealing with. Family members who have been displaced, lots of jobs, supporting our staff, right? So we got to support the staff that are doing the work at the same time, present ourselves with the right amount of energy. You know, um, I know I probably not speaking just for myself, but not taking the time off we deserve and self care of ourselves while at the same time being mindful that this is a whole generation that's coming, that's going to be impacted by this. So. You're absolutely right. I hadn't thought of it that way. That's. Yeah, um, I'd like you know, to add. I actually would like to add some information to really um, fully um, flesh out this conversation. You heard that about just under 20% of folks um, are really uh, doubting that they will be able to make their rent payment um, in September. But the fuller picture about that is that of the total number of folks who were interviewed at the beginning of the month and subsequently um, towards the end of the month were asked, you know, so have you paid your rent? Are you behind? Only 30% of those folks had paid their rent and be from the beginning to the time that they were asked again um, with this particular report. So in other words, 70% of those folks still had not figured out how to pay their rent. 20, about 20% said, I just don't know if I'm gonna be able to pay it. And to give you an even bigger, um, better context for this, even with um, providing three months of rent support, folks are far more behind in their rent than three months. So right. even if someone is four months behind and they've received supports for three months, they're still at risk of being evicted once that moratorium lifts um, in, um, in October. And so given that, I'd like to ask you another question. And this really goes to the, the current um, state eviction moratorium. So for anyone who would like to answer this, tenant and housing advocacy organizations are urging Washington Governor Jay Inslee to extend the current Washington State eviction moratorium until March of 2021. So a couple of questions. Are you in favor of this? Or do you think there is some other policy approach that would help ensure people remain housed 
and that landlords can continue to retain ownership of their property. So one is, are you in favor of it? Or do you think there's another way to do this and ensure that the landlords can keep their properties? Well, I always speak up <laughs> and uh, I, I am against it and I'm for it. <laughs> and uh, reason being is I've had too many landlords call that that's their only source of income. So if they were in favor of, of continuing the moratorium, they would have zero income and property taxes have been impacted. And there's very little help for people to help with their property taxes. But if in fact we could continue it by the time the moratorium is over, we, people wouldn't be as far behind and some landlords would have some income. So it's a double-edged sword any way you look at it. So we possibly need more state money put into it or federal money or wherever we can get the money, private money. And then there are the people that don't have access to technology. Those are some of the people, some of our seniors that are out there that call about their property taxes that are really, really hurting, that had little side jobs only to pay their property taxes. And I get calls like that every single day. Those are the people that are really hurting. Or, or some of the people that are really hurting. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. Sister Linda, I appreciate that you can see both sides of that. And I've seen in conversations so many times, folks are leaning one way so much and ignore the other. But so I appreciate you kicking us off with that. Seeing both sides. Uh, we do have a cold weather moratorium as well that starts in King County, in Seattle rather, that, um, you know, it's, it's, I am very sensitive to those landlords. Um, However, of course, I tend to be really, really pro people. So I'll probably swing on pretty far end of the spectrum in terms of um, supporting the moratorium until, until March. But there's probably other resources that I'd wanna see complement this toward the landlord and towards those families that aren't just rent. Because again, we need to think big, right? And how do we fully support these families, not just with rent, but making sure that they have the resources they need just to live the day-to-day -day lives. I'm concerned about these kids who, don't, who are not in contact with each other the social and emotional well-being of these children or not playing with each other. I'm concerned about folks who are in households with a lot of intimacy that are not healthy, whether it's a DV situation in the household or other things that these kids are privy to 24 hours a day when they had some relief for at least eight to nine hours while they went to school. So we need to make sure that we're not ignoring those other aspects that really heavily impact these children while this uh, COVID situations happening. So I see the moratorium as a pause that allows for really strong dialogue, partnership and creating alternatives. And I feel very powerfully that we wasted the pause that gave us from April through now of actually addressing some of the issues that Walter has brought up. So rather than looking about, we need more cash to pay for rent what are we going to do with those who have historically been poor and not able to make it on a 40 hour a week job? And what are we doing with those who are the new poor that aren't able to do that? And approach the next, if we were lucky enough to get six months, I believe the best policy approach is to look at the next six months and look at it from a perspective of bringing the, a lot of the ideas that Walter has offered, bring those to bear to solve the basic needs of people and also think big enough, like a new deal kind of thing is to put people to work, whether it be in new different there's a lot of companies that are making a lot of money right now. Can we shift and make sure that we open up the door for more economic opportunities in the midst of a global pandemic? Can we figure out that there are collective solutions? Um, and one of the things I was gonna mention, Linda, and we can look at it later, my husband's great with numbers, but there's a simple fact, we think about homelessness is the lack of houses. If you use the census numbers and you take the total number this is, I knew Corbett, or he's gotten his pencil out. He's going to start adding these numbers up. But if you take <laughs> the total number of houses, of housing units, 
and you take the total number of households, we have 7,000 more units than we have people in those houses. Mm -hmm. So the issue is not building more buildings. The issue is changing about how we access it, which at this moment is an economic access. And so we've got to deal with that economic piece. But it's also the distribution. Who's allowed to be in those different houses? Do you feel comfortable with them? How do we overcome that? That I think that if we have another six months, that has got to come tied to a profound commitment to lean in and to figure out how we get creative as a community to solve it. And I just offer Hawaii made a huge commitment back in April of a feminist approach to economic recovery that can give us some hope that other people have big pictures and other states have taken in the CARES money and given it out in a way that helps the collective more than it does the individuals for just a couple months. So I challenge us to get more creative. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with you 100% that we do need to get a bit more creative with it. Uh, we haven't rolled out the mortgage portion of it yet. I think there's a couple of agencies doing the mortgage portion in Pierce County, but ours doesn't roll out until Friday. So, you know, people are, people are scared. They're scared. You'll see more in the Dispute Resolution Center coming up soon, but that won't happen until the first of the year. So pe people are afraid. They, they really are. They're getting notices from landlords that don't know the uh, rules, and, and they're just moving out. They're coming to us asking for assistance, finding another place. Some of the landlords are actually uh, scaring people to death. We just did it one in King County and they're borrowing from people and so they're owing other people. They're just doing anything they can to make some of these rental and mortgage payments. Mm -hmm. Running up debt. So I'm hearing um, some mixed responses in terms of your feeling about the uh, potentially the, the governor extending the existing moratorium for um, through March. Um, and there and certainly there's pros and cons to that, right? Because as Linda mentioned, um, you know, there's, it helps on one hand, and then on the other hand, it, there's the question about um, how do we um, address the needs of the property owners? And I would go further to say, especially those small mom and pop property owners who, um, this is their livelihood. So um, I'm gonna, yes, Corbett. Um, I just wanted to um, point out that uh, I think that if you, if there was a way to draw a rough um, calculation about the social impact of mass evictions and what that would cost our economy and community. Um, I think that people would would understand that that trying to to, to deal with it and prevent it um, and figure out how we work um, on on preventing that to happen far outweighs um, what would happen if we don't. Um, and 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 when you again when you think about the disparity component. Do you know, there's, uh, I remember when um, the Urban League uh, did the State of Black Tacoma report a couple of years ago, and we actually went back a couple of years to look at the disparity and unemployment rate for Black um, uh, workers um, during the last recession. And when the unemployment rate was, you know, 9 and 10% for all other uh, communities, for the Black community here in, in Tacoma and Pierce County, it was still 18, 19%. It was almost double um, what it was for other communities. Um, and when we look at the disparities that exist with um, our black youth um, who are disproportionately represented, represented in, um, um, in, in homelessness, um, you know, the, the, this thing is something that um, would just exacerbate the, the issues and, and drive deeper wedges within uh, communities of color. Um, but the total economic impact, even if you took out the disparity uh, part of it it, 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 it would impact our system so greatly that we would not be able to have uh, the kinds of programs and the kinds of, we just, to Linda's, um, uh, Ms. Taylor's point too, there's, 
we don't have the staff um, in the nonprofit and social service sector to deal with that kind of response um, or that kind of need. And so we, we need other partners to come together to figure out what that looks like um, and, to, and to try to respond in a different way. And, and so I think it's just important to kind of acknowledge um, you know, the, the, the deep disparities that exist, which I know we kind of, we kind of did, but the understanding that the unemployment rate was almost double, um, you know, people of color, black people were first to be, uh, first to be let go and last to come back uh, on board. Um, and, and so it, it's, um, uh, then you add in housing on top of that, but not to mention the social implications. Walter talked about how, uh, you know, how kids and families are impacted when you look at the healthy youth survey and understand the disparities exist within that about the feeling of safety, um, the economic cost of having a, um, you know, a couple of generations of kids go through homelessness in Tacoma or Pierce County and the sense of their safety, their sense of their identity, their sense of their well-being and being a, uh, in a safe and nurturing environment where they can grow. Um, and then for the system of education to try to respond to that, um, um, in that instability is more than what we have funding to be able to um, address. So it, it is, uh, I, I think that there's an argument to support the extension of the um, eviction moratorium to, um, and, um, you know, but I can see both sides of it, of it really impacting um, people's livelihoods, um, especially small property owners that maybe own one or two houses. And they just, they just kind of uh, try to, you know, generate wealth for themselves and their family and that being a negative impact on, on them. We got to figure it out in a different way. Mm -hmm. For that, Corbett. Um, and I'd like to take us to a little bit further thinking about the ways that federal and state governments are trying to help us to fight off this surge in evictions. Um, there have been an increase in resources, not just for rental assistance, but also for mortgage assistance, which is what um, Ms. Taylor is, is discussing. So let's talk about the types of assistance that's out there. Um, and Corbett, I think you can offer us a short over overview of um, eviction, rental assistance, um, CARES Act funding, um, energy assistance um, that's being provided for rental assistance through MDC, City of Tacoma rental assistance. And then for everyone directly after that, you may want to write this down. I, I want to know, considering the Department of Commerce knows that 100 million in eviction rental assistance funding is much smaller than the actual need, what other types, um, what are other options that people can pursue to ensure that they can remain in their housing. So if you want to share additional resources that you are familiar with, but Corbett, we'll start with you with an overview and then we'll have everyone else kind of jump in to help us to figure out how we'll fill hey, the gap. Um, uh, uh, Rob and, and Dr. Uh, Duncan, I might need a little bit of help, but I'm gonna try to walk through uh, some of these. So the eviction rental assistance program is a statewide program offered with a hundred million allocated out to counties and organizations to distribute to those in need. So Pierce County received 10 million that must be distributed by the end of December, 2020. Um, and currently the county is working through a backlog of, of applications and there is hope that uh, they will be able to reopen applications um, in October to help more people uh, once the backlog has been cleared. So then we have the CARES Act funding. Um, and so Pierce County has also received rental assistance funds through the CARES Act. Um, and um, the way that I understand it, the relief funds are approved earlier this year by Congress and the county is still working, uh, is, is working to distribute these funds as well. Um, the, then we have energy assistance, rental assistance. So as a community action agency with an energy assistance program, MDC also has rental assistance dollars available to help households within the Tacoma city limits and that meet the same qualifications as our energy assistance program. So what that means is that the household has to meet income qualifications for the number um, of, of living in a household. Um, and then there's the city of Tacoma rental assistance um, that they also receive dollars that are available for Tacoma City residents and the distribution of those funds is being handled by the um, uh, by LASA Live in Access Support Alliance um, and so their website is lasapierce.org. 
Um, let me know if I've covered most of them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. There's one other, we call it free 253, which is a combination of rental assistance, the housing justice project through Tacoma Pro Bono that gives legal advice, which is sort of what um, Linda was referring to earlier. A lot of people don't know what their rights are. And so there's free legal advice. There's also access to fair housing because there's some real serious discrimination happening right now. So along with the Center for Dialogue that offers mediation, free 253, which if you uh, touch, go to TacomaProBono.org, that's the best way to connect to both rental assistance, legal assistance, and then to sit down and mediate. Because not all the issues with the landlord and tenant have to do with lack of payment. And we're trying to establish stronger relationships and lines of communication. So once these three months of rent are paid, and there may be a future economic crisis, their lines of communication are open. So that's an important piece to add to it. Thank you, Corbett. Corporate has spoken to $10 million um, coming to the county. The Wellspring Family Services is administering $1 million of that, um, which we're pretty excited about. We're also um, supporting a few of families who have been displaced by fire and smoke more recently. Um, and that's been something we're kind of trying to fundraise for and to help more families in that area. My most excited, I think, opportunity right now that we're providing funds, prevention funds through Tacoma, Tacoma Public Schools with um, the TSHAP project in uh, collaboration with Tacoma Housing Authority. So for all students who are McKinney-Vento status students, and we're expecting a 40% jump in those students this year, okay. all McKinney-Vento status students okay. are eligible to be served by Wellspring Family okay. Services uh, with prevention services. Okay. So um, okay. if you were displaced by COVID or any other reason, okay. they're extremely flexible and we're able to serve those families who are experiencing displacement um, potentially related to COVID. So Pam, you asked us a dual part question. You said, what about the assistance that we know of and what are other assistance that are needed? Did you ask, was that the two part question? That yeah. was that was Twina. And I, actually I would say um, that in addition to the rental assistance and every revenue stream that we can get to assist with rental assistance is great. And also for folks to be able to access energy assistance. So um, folks need assistance with um, paying their utility bills because that is a way, quiet as, as it's kept, that's a way that people can end up being evicted as well. If they are renting and their utilities are shut off, they can be evicted um, because of that. And Metropolitan Development Council does provide those services as well. And um, weatherization. So um, that helps to keep your utility bills down. Maybe I'll just quickly mention another issue that I see kind of coming up related to this is um, the issue of people renting units um, below what they could afford. Um, and so what we have a we have a crisis right now with with low income uh, housing. So I'm not talking about affordable housing, but extremely low income um, housing units. We need 8000 more units right now to meet the the demand um, that's that's in our community. We need 5400 uh, very low income units where people can only pay to uh, afford to pay $700 a month in, in rent um, and then low income uh, units 4000 so this is from Tacoma Housing Authority uh, data but I'm sure that the this is from two years ago so it might be a little bit more but altogether you know, 12,000 more units um, uh, that are all under what people under a thousand dollars or less um, and sometimes you know four hundred dollars so what I think might happen is with the workforce instability, with economic instability, is people actually taking up units um, at a different price point, lower than what they normally would. Um, and so that adds more pressure to a housing stock that we don't already, that we don't, that doesn't exist. Um, and so they're more likely to be qualified because they meet all of the, more of the income requirements. Um, and, and that just adds a lot more pressure to units that we don't have. 
So that brings to the part that um, we've talked about the rental assistance, we've talked about the weatherization, we've talked about immediate emergence funds that we know aren't quite enough, but they can get out the door. And to another degree, I think most nonprofits are worried we not, may not spend all that money by the end of the year. So that's an <laughs> urgent piece. But I want to think about our Senator Nobles, who will soon be a senator, that part of us, we need to talk about um, one piece that I feel really nervous about is we're not including the banks in this conversation. They own the foreclosure of that mom and pop landlord tenant. They also have the foreclosure of the large multi-house that's run by a corporate um, by a corporate property management. Can we talk about in the middle of a pandemic that actual market rate is not how we set rents, that we set rents that make sure the building can pay for its cost and the investment of the investors, but at the same time, it's as a price that people who live on limited income are able to pay for it. That somehow we need to figure out that is much more of a systemic piece but to bring those stakeholders to the table. The other resource that I think that we're, we haven't quite figured out how to dip into, and obviously as a nonprofit that runs with all, non, with all volunteer labor, I'm very aware of it. Those who are staying in their home because they're lucky enough to have it, as Walter identified, and they're over a certain age, are feeling isolated and put off to the side and may have some technology difficulties because they're, you know, they've got the nice gray hairs like I have. Mm -hmm. And then we have the young people who are isolated and not knowing and, and not knowing how to, I mean, that, that piece of that. Can, is there a way that we can touch those untapped populations in human resources? I end up talking about the people who live on my street. I live on Yakima and I have a lot of neighbors that have a variety of different tents and in the conversations with them, they've got some really good ideas. They had a nice place two months ago. They've got some really good ideas. So that's where some of the creativity could get started in terms of anyone who has recently been evicted be part of the dialogue about what are the emergency solutions. Because when the care dollars are gone, all we have left are the human beings that we have in Pierce County, our incredible creativity, and our brilliant new legislators. We've got to give those legislators some creative ideas that they can begin turning into policies. So that's a, a good place to start with the next question that you've actually elevated, Mayor Lees. Um, and so for everyone, what kinds of conversations and partnerships are emerging in our community to help address the potential eviction crisis. And that is rent and mortgage, because I know, especially at the Urban Leagues, we encourage home ownership as well and are helping with home ownership. So we want to make sure, Ms. Taylor, that you get those resources and partnerships named too. Okay. Well, the main thing is people don't know about forbearances. You can pick up the call your mortgage company and get a forbearance, a three-month forbearance, and that mortgage company will extend it. You can extend it about three times. They'll take it, put it toward the back of your loan. When it first came out, they were telling people that they had to pay it in a lump sum. But what some people are doing are going back to work, have the forbearance, and now you're going to be in trouble. That's what's going to happen to a lot of people because you could afford it at one point in time, but chose to stay on the forbearance. So we don't know how that's going to play out. If you get a notice of default, a notice of foreclosure, you need to call the nonprofit. You need to call us. We do what's called mortgage mediation. You end up with more lease at the Dispute Resolution Center, and we sit there and we talk to your mortgage company if there is an issue. So there, there are ways people can keep their home. There are, there are a lot of ways and people uh, really, they don't, people don't open their mail. That's what we find more than anything. People do not open their mail and miss some of the deadlines because there are clear, clear deadlines. But what we have found are people that take home ownership classes prior to purchasing their home usually do not end up in that situation because we train them. We, we give that information in your class, your home ownership class. And so people know what to do. Mm -hmm. But people that don't know what to do, I used to have foreclosure classes in the middle of the crisis before. 
and we the first question would be 40, 50 people sitting in the classroom. And we say, how many have taken a home ownership class prior to purchasing their home? And it was generally zero. It was generally zero. And so that's what we found to be true. But Pierce County has a, and King does also, has a mortgage um, assistance program that's rolling out a couple, like I say, Habitat's doing it. Ours is going to roll out on Monday, I think. We're getting all of our information on Friday, but it'll pay up to three months mortgage payments, up to $5,000 per owner. So that's going to be a real help. And we've partnered with the Tacoma Urban League once again, and they'll have two, three highly trained people that can help you through that process. I believe Homesite will be issuing the dollars, but you have to go through a housing counseling agency to get there. And we have that contract. But it, uh, and then I think there's a different one for veterans also, but it's the same process. So there is help out there. And when we say that um, extending the mortgage moratorium, and I mean, the rental moratorium, and for people that, uh, 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 well, well, I forgot exactly the way, the way it was put, but my concern, along with the other concerns that hasn't been mentioned, are the people that own their own homes, that don't have a mortgage company to worry about but that this income is their only source of income. Those are the people that qualify for little or nothing. So if we extend the mortgage moratorium, those are the pe people, or the rental moratorium, I'm sorry. Those are the people that are hurt and they tend to be seniors depending on this money to pay their property taxes and to live on monthly. So what would it take if we as a community would say, rental assistance is going to be prioritized to those landlords who are living on a fixed i mean there's no reason we couldn't approach it from that perspective in terms of making sure the most vulnerable are being addressed immediately um that's a i don't know if anybody's actually thought about let's prioritize it according to is no. it a large corporation no they haven't they haven't at least it hasn't come across my desk so well, why don't we propose that okay yeah. But I think I, I'm hearing two different things. I think I'm hearing Ms. Taylor, if I um, interpreted this correctly, what you are talking about is a concern about those um, homeowners who have paid off their home mm -hmm. and they, they, so it's not about dealing with a mortgage company. Exactly. It's about the taxes and being <laughs> evicted because of a tax foreclosure. That's well, what you're a tax saying. foreclosure and this being their only source of income. They rent out space in their home. They rent out space in their home. Ah. A rental house or their Okay. So rooms. that's what Mary Lee's picked up on. I just picked up on the first part, which is significant in itself. I mean, you think about folks who are not renting out a space in their home and they potentially face um, an eviction. They face losing their home because right. of a tax foreclosure. And they don't even have any other income coming in. Exactly. There's that group of people. There's about four different buckets that we can really, really talk about. But I've had so many seniors call me talking about this is their only source of income. And we have encouraged them to get additional income by renting out rooms. And now what we've encouraged them to do is backfiring on us. Mm -hmm. And we should be supporting that. So I think from a, from a conflict resolution perspective, we really need to define what are the real issues. And there are many issues that we've talked about tonight and they're all interconnected. But if we don't deal with all the issues and just sort of say this is one solution, then we're trying to solve something which is referred to as the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. We gotta get concrete and specific about what are the problems and the basic needs and approach it from address those who are most vulnerable because that's what the CARES Act, that's what those money's coming into. Um, and there are landlords who are generous and who are willing to sit down and talk and they shouldn't be penalized because they're generous 
generous and they're willing to talk because we want to make sure they don't lose their properties. So I, sorry, I feel passionate about it. <laughs> so I'm glad so you did it. Yeah, we all are glad you glad you are also. Mr. Pam, um, I had a quick response. Um, sure. I think your question about the types of conversations that I've been having um, have kind of been threaded around making resources portable. So even some of the resources we talked about today, are they reaching the people who need them the most? Right. So it's one thing to have a resource and just say that's available, but who is it reaching? And how do we make that resource portable to people of color in particular who might not have the habit of checking with technology and resources, right? We all know that people of color tend to like to be outreached too. We like the intimacy with the service that's serving us. So we're talking about how do we take these CARES money dollars and put them into the hands of folks who can do that outreach and making sure that these smaller nonprofits don't close the doors that have these relationships, tend to be POC led with people of color, right? Who tend to be ignored because they have a staff of 10 or a staff of eight or a staff of sometimes three, but they didn't have the fundraiser, so they're closing the doors, right? So it's really up to us, and I, I would say we're one of the larger nonprofits to connect with those smaller nonprofits and to figure out how to reach their people to work together. They can keep their doors open and we can also serve those people and make sure that our resources are portable. Well, I love the message that you all are carrying across as well. Like there is help out here. There are resources that exist. And what we, you know, as we move forward with questions, I want to make sure the community understands that with all of these organizations on the line tonight, all of the individuals on the line tonight, if you need help, help is here. It is important to get help early so we can try to be more preventative and, and intervene um, instead of responsive. Um, but help is help is available. So I really appreciate you all naming the resources and opportunities to help our community tonight. And I yeah. can jump to, I wanna, oh, Corbett, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to um, just kind of piggyback on something that Walter said that, that triggered a, a thought for, for me. I think that the system of uh, connectors and social service agencies um, we also need to improve the way that we screen clients for benefits that they qualify for. Um, and so particular, um, you know, programs might have one particular focus, like maybe their focus is employment or maybe their focus is education. And it's not some of these other um, barriers that get in the way of, of, of clients. And, and, and right now would be a probably really important time for those providers that have those relationships and maybe they're touching on with a client for one particular need, um, uh, but asking the question um, and opening the, the door for broad screening for benefits and resources that clients qualify for. Um, so I think that there's a part of this that's a practice from the social service side about how, how um, agencies respond that we can improve uh, during this time and we need to think about the coordination of that. It really is a practice of screening people for benefits, whether it's food, TANF, rental assistance, utility assistance. Many times there's probably clients that organizations are already serving that have been qualified for a 30% reduction in their utility um, expenses. And so, it, and, and, and we just never asked or we never told them about it. Um, so I think that broad knowledge around what those public resources are and making sure that frontline staff and, 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 and organizers really know how to ask those simple questions and get people set up with those, with those applications. And in some cases, helping them fill it out uh, is, is really the response that the social service sector has to take um, in, in our approach. Mm -hmm. Agreed. So, uh, Twina, I know you are about to um, transition to another question. I, I want to also highlight in terms of emerging conversations, there is a convening that is being scheduled, and I want to um, uh, frame it as more, more than a convening, a strategizing session that um, we are pulling together lenders, uh, service providers, property owners, 
tenant advocates, elected officials, um, other key stakeholders, uh, so that we can figure this out before there is mass evictions. So MDC is um, um, already communicating with key stakeholders, and I, I failed to mention also uh, foundations, so that we can um, bring our best thinking together to figure out how we offset what could happen with the lifting of the moratorium. Thank you. That sounds exciting. Oh yeah, it does. <laughs> um, it's really exciting and I'm grateful that MDC is leading in that way, um, convening community members for a very important work and conversation and, and action more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, I, I did hear discussion a little bit about um, generating revenue for community members. It wasn't necessarily targeted at employment options, but I want to shift a little bit to think about the impacts on employment. And I'm curious to know if the panel has um, the advice put on what steps people may be able to take to increase their income during this time or to be able to catch back up on rent. Um, to, Linda mentioned some ways to, to, to get some assistance and, and help as folks are trying to catch back up on their mortgage. Um, but if you have any advice or if you want to speak to, you know, what the landscape looks like today, but more importantly, if you, if you have advice for community members who are simply trying to catch up and figure out how they can generate additional income, because we do need to think about sustainability and the longer term impacts of this pandemic and, and how we're going to help our community um, in the long term. Mm. I'll, I'm going to just throw out a, a, a thought um, to it. one thing that we know is that when the unemployment rate goes down, the um, or when the unemployment rate, rate goes up, uh, there's a lot more folks that return back to school to, um, uh, you know, complete their post-secondary credentials um, or take, you know, a lot of folks had some some college credit but never completed. It, it might be a good time, um, you know, as people are, are you know, working part-time, maybe they're, they're not, they don't have a full schedule right now, but it might be a good time to leverage this opportunity to kind of investigate whether or not that's the right move for you. Um, and, and there's other, you um, resources about funding your education. Um, you know, MDC has a TRIO uh, program that's called Educational Opportunity Centers that has educational advisors at um, all of the community and technical colleges and, and the universities in the area um, that are running different virtual workshops about how to, um, about funding for your, your, um, your school. So whether or not that be loans, scholarships, grants, work study, um, I think now is a, a time for some folks where it might be a good time for them to return back to school and to complete some kind of post-secondary credential, which will prepare them for a job um, when the economy opens back up and we get things going again. So there might be a really good opportunity to really think about that moving forward. That is a good, uh, um, some financial security as you're enrolled in the school. Um, and most um, folks, I would say, uh, in terms of employers, really look for students um, too, that, um, uh, and that that could be a really good opportunity for folks moving forward. So the Urban League has a uh, employment program was a workforce program where a lot of the people that are even in the mortgage foreclosure or the people that come through needing rental assistance are referred to. So that, that helps them. Get, and of course, all that training is virtual. And we've all been holding virtual uh, employment fairs and people have been um, hired on the spot, interviewed right there, going into the chat rooms and doing just all kinds of creative things and getting jobs. So we're real happy about that, a, a lot of that. And that's why, uh, to, I think it was to Walter's point about helping smaller nonprofits, that's um, exactly what we all want to do. We started off with 
tons, a lot of housing counselors across the country. But uh, since the last economic downturn, we have lost a lot of housing counselors. And now that they, um, that we need to all be certified, and we have a lot that have gone through the certification training and have gotten certified and are able to deliver. And a lot of the, um, a, a lot of our grants are going to require that. So especially a lot of our federal grants. And so we are working very hard to get everyone trained up to, uh, I think the between our Puget Sound Urban Leagues, we have more trained housing counselors than any other urban league. So we're real proud about that. And several still in training, working hard. That's good work, Linda. Um, I'm so pessimistic on this question. I'm kind of struggling for something to say that's optimistic, I think. Um, I don't see pathways for a lot of our families that are like right in front of us to increase their income. Obviously, in investigating opportunities to work from home. When some of our families might have been having had a, had a household going downtown or going into work, what can you actually do from home while your kid is working or doing his schoolwork or her schoolwork at home? Looking at those types of opportunities, but I am super pessimistic in the short term. And of course, we're all kind of um, waiting to see what November looks like um, onward. But yeah, I don't have a whole lot of creative solutions for that, but bringing up income, I've seen some really cool things in terms of communities working together around childcare, because as we all know, that is a heavy burden for families. Even working heads of households still need that childcare solution. Now I've seen some communities come together and be a bit more intimate and creative around childcare solutions, which can be, as you all know, um, upward of twelve, fourteen hundred dollars per month per child. So. It's really hard to get creative when you are in crisis and you don't know where, I mean, you, you're just in crisis mode. It's hard to get creative. It's nice to think about going to school and learning something. It's nice to think that there'll be another job and you can learn stuff. But sometimes our heads, our hearts are just so filled. So um, to be optimistic about um, making money in another low paying job is really, and I could, I could get it, it's really hard. I do believe that with the shift in the economy, with the amazing shift in how we have to interact, if we can take the most negative of all situations and come up with how do we solve that problem and be able to afford to pay high quality. Out of this experience, I think we're all gonna agree that quality childcare is worth every penny that teachers who actually know how to engage and enthrall their students and come up with product are worth their weight in gold. That those professions that we've considered frontline and um, not necessarily high paid, I think we need to shift and adjust them. And in the meantime, what are you supposed to do? Um, I've already reached out to Tamar Jackson, which I know some of you are on Facebook with him of saying young people right now need a job. Well, at this moment, not everybody like Rob Huff can do a technical hosting of this kind of a webinar, but I'm willing to train an army of 20 year olds or a cohort of 20 to 22 year olds who can be there to facilitate all of this online stuff that we have going on. Right now we've got mediators who are delighted to mediate, just have somebody deal with the technical. So there's a, there's a position, there's, t t there's being tutors. Um, I think what limits us is this sense of crisis mentality and this feeling that each of us have to solve it on our own. That if nonprofits could step up and say, I need a new staff person and I need to ramp up fast, where is the human resource prep that's gonna to make that pairing and make it happen? And I know we got workforce development and I'm working with them to figure out how to do it. But I believe in times of great need, we are willing to step up and grow and change, and we can change the caregiving economy into the core piece of what Pierce County is about. So mm. I don't have any great solutions for you, Walter. I just don't want you to lose the faith that mm. the beings who are listening to us are the most creative. And so that's the last piece I wanted to offer from a conflict resolution perspective. Mm. The most powerful players in conflict resolution are the people who have lived it. 
So if, if you're going to have your, your um, sort of creative dialogue to be able to get creative, I think we need to use people who are recently evicted to be part of the conversation. And that's hard and that's painful and that also they're not in the best sense of the frame of mind. But we got to figure out ways that cr we create safe places for people to feel comfortable enough and that collectively we're going to hold each other up to be able to face this. Marilise, thank you. Um for a truly um, very insightful and profound response. And as you were speaking, I was thinking 2020 is the year that changes everything, right? We uh, just earlier today, we were just talking about, we can't even keep up with the list of things, but here, here's the thing, everything changes, but we also have the opportunity to create the narrative for how we responded to the space we find ourselves in now, um, because it's going to change. So how much of that do we drive and do we determine what that change looks like? Um, so, and that takes me to, um, I actually have one last question that I think is very uh, relevant to where we are now in this conversation. And, and this is for everyone. Are there steps that those who are actually doing fairly well financially through this crisis can take to help their neighbors who are struggling right now? What do you think that would look like? So I'm actually asking you to just popcorn and come up with um, what those um, steps could look like. I, I just want to, I, I think what is important is um, to check in with your neighbors, mm -hmm. you know, check in with, um, if you, if you have kids, just pay attention to what, you know, your, your kids friends are, are going through. And um, the other day I, I had to catch myself cause I was complaining cause my son um, kept going in the pantry and he took out all of the snack boxes and took out all, it was on the, like, who are you feeding? And it was, and I, had to, um, he's sharing, you know, what we had um, in there, um, you know, with, with his neighbor friends. I don't know if they, if, you know, he said he eats over at their house too, but um, it, you never know. Um, and I just think that it's important that to, to kind of, you know, check in on your, your neighbors uh, we have people that live in our neighborhood, you know, that are in w wheelchairs that might not be getting around to different places like they used to because things are closed. Um, but it's just about knowing, you know, the space that you're around and checking in with folks and just being, you know, um, you know, just being a good person and 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 um, uh, and and being available. But I think it's particularly important that we pay attention to how young people, particularly children, are feeling. And, and what parents are going through, and that that being really the rally uh, group that we really need to check in on um, and to be, uh, be supportive of. Um, and uh, that's, that's where, I, that's where I, I, I think that is um, a really important place to be. And Corbett, a piece of that is we are afraid to talk to our neighbors. We're afraid that in these times that are polarized, that someone's going to take what we have to say the wrong way. Like, I don't need your help. So can we also, as we get to know our neighbors, actually approach anyone around us with an openness and a sense of good intent? And if their response is somewhat closed, recognize they are in crisis mode right now and they've got a knee jerk reaction happening that if those who feel that they've got a house over their a roof over their heads and they've got food use some of that privilege as grace to bring to your neighbors to be able to offer people to speak up and say their truth of what's happening at any given moment um i think it's really powerful the other piece is um of course we're all going to ask that if you feel comfortable enough then think about what it is you want to use your extra income and invest it. And don't think about it as charity for a nonprofit, but where can you best invest your dollars to help resolve this problem from a global perspective? Or if what you want is to make sure there's food, you know exactly where to donate. So 
I invite those who feel like they have a roof over their heads and food to bring grace to the conversation and to be empathetic and understanding that some people are really having a rotten, terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day or year, as you might say, Pam, for 2020. <laughs> and then to think about investing. If you feel like you have something extra to invest it in the variety of resources that have been mentioned. Yep, yep, yep. Well, what we've done to hopefully bridge some of that is we've partnered with a, a local senior center and they have the seniors that shouldn't come out and then they have the seniors that they know are homebound and we've been delivering food to them and the way we deliver the food has had to change. Uh, we just, they all have social rooms so we actually set up look like grocery stores and their social rooms and they take care of one another very, very well with that. But that's only one building. How many buildings are there that, that need that sort of thing? And we're just kind of doing it on a trial basis to see if it works and it's working. So there are a lot of things. I want to talk to Walter just a little bit more about how he's solving the childcare situation because we have staff members that don't have childcare. And of course we mm -hmm. keep them here. So that, that's one thing we really need to solve is that childcare situation. That, that, that's much greater than, I mean, they expect the children to stay at home and be on Zoom by themselves. The teenagers that can stay home by themselves don't do it. I, I probably got off topic. As soon as you <laughs> leave, they, they leave, they leave the Zoom. So, you know, the 14, 15 year olds need a babysitter. So everybody needs somebody to uh, hold them accountable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about um, folks who might not even have the money to give, but don't know that there's still volunteer opportunities that are available. Folks might think that everyone's doors are closed. I can't help. I've got to kind of hunker down. But you can help still, even if you don't have dollars to give. Right? There are so many opportunities to you invest your time whether it's making masks, whether it's delivering food, whether you have an IT expertise that a nonprofit would love to leverage, you can help with websites, all sorts of things. Almost everybody has something that can be leveraged outside of um, money. And a lot of us have more time because we're not driving to meetings. Now, that means we have back-to-back -back Zoom meetings, things like that. So if a lot of us aren't driving to meetings, we're just about more efficient. So I would want to put that out in the flag that there are still tons of ways to help and invest your time and will. And the other thing I would say is that um, I think there's kind of a crisis of love right now. Uh, folks are not living lovingly because um, you're looking at your Facebook, you got doom and gloom going on in the news. And how do we just challenge ourselves to live lovingly? And I think that goes to my brother Corbett's point about checking in with the neighbor. Um, and really just making sure that we're checking ourselves and make sure that we're really arriving to hear other people's struggles, not just be so self-centered or internally focused. You're absolutely right. I'm in a women's social club and that came up. We need to call one another. So they're making that a point, even in a social club of people that are social, you know, that they're isolated. Everyone is one way or another. So you're absolutely right, Walter. Check in with your neighbor, whoever it is. They don't have to live next door to you. Call your relatives. Call, do Zoom calls with them, but check in with people. Mm -hmm. That includes folks that you might have had a falling out with. No better time. No better time with somebody who owes you $200 from 2005. <laughs> Say, hey, man, you know what? It's all good, <laughs> you know? Sure, I can still use it when you can give it, but let's just chop that up for now. And yeah, talk how you about, doing? Mm -hmm. Congratulate you for your, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, one, of my, my, one of my favorite quotes uh, that I saw, I think from the, um, maybe it was the Casey Foundation, um, children do well when families do well and families do better when they live in supported communities. Um, if we can, if, if that can be a little bit of a North Star um, uh, for folks to make sure that 
that that we minimize children's you know kids impact in this thing and and listen to them and talk to them and support them and support our neighbors and and uh, frankly a number of vulnerable populations um i i think we all win um and i think that we uh you know people are better off so children do well when families do well better and families do better when we live in supported communities and i just want to list some final resources for families. At Tacoma Urban League, we have our Black Parents Alliance, which is, you know, an important resource right now as families are navigating remote learning and how to support their students, how to connect them with necessary resources, whether it's special ed services um, or, you know, food services. We have a support group. We also have a mom and babies of color support group that meets every Thursday. We have our male involvement program for young men in elementary through high school to plug into um, black male mentors. And so we are trying our best to offer um, those support groups to our community members who may not have them um, elsewhere. So feel free to um, contact us at thetacomaurbanleague.org. And, oh, go ahead. I saw some, Mary Lee, she wanted mute it. Go ahead. No, go ahead and finish your thought. I was just going to make sure, I think it's, there's a question in the chat and I was, um, texting a person who asked a question to see if they felt like it was answered. But the question in the chat, and, and Marylise, you can answer, you can speak and then folks can answer this, but the question is, what do, sorry, what does the panel suggest the state legislature do in the 2021 session um, if there is no federal response between now and January? So I was going to sort of find hope in really negative, horrific, bad times, we've come through them. One of the things I'm holding really close to the fact is that out of the World War II, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and a series of other women came up with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights just mere three years later. My husband just pointed out to me that during the India Revolution, when India became independent, there are a series of people who went around and talked about the landless peasants and actually got land donated and was able to come up with a collective idea. There are out of global, big, huge problems, amazingly creative ideas that if, if I were to answer Jason's question about what should the legislature do is I think they need to take off their limitations of what can we do just right now to finish this emergency? And what can we do to lay the foundation for the new society that we're gonna build, that we're going to be supportive, we're going to be loving, we're going to understand that for years to come, the trauma induced by this situation is going to impact human relations and we need to approach this from a trauma-informed perspective. That I would invite the legislature, and that means our new senator, to be really, truly creative. And I think that means the rest of us have got to step up and start sharing creative ideas between now and December so they got something to chew on and come up with a much more systemic response. How's that, Joanna? I, I have one. It might be small, but, uh, but, but I find it existing. It's like back when Katrina, that's how long I've been doing this work, but we had no uh, reciprocity for people with other licenses from different states. We, we didn't honor any licenses in our state. So I propose in times of emergency or times of, of federal emergency or something that we uh, do something about some of those licenses, that they are transferable, maybe temporary, that, that we accept some of them. I've had just recently people have relocated to our state and they can't get a job, but they are a licensed something in their state. And uh, we don't accept that, them at all. But in, in times of emergency, uh, I'm not saying we change up everything, but I am saying that at least in times of emergency, that we do look at that, that we do look at accepting some of those licenses that they have in areas of expertise. And, and I, I would say um, that this, it's, it's kind of a strategy that's tied in with the economy and small businesses, um, that employers play a very important role in promote, promoting and supporting workers' educational completion um, through, 
you know, tuition programs or negotiating flexible schedules and that kind of thing. Um, I think uh, there could be an opportunity um, that maybe Washington State sh could pass a, a, a business tax credit for incentivizing employers to pay for employees' public college tuition and state approved certifications um, that would target low wage workers with um, income below this, the um, state's minimum uh, medium wage. So how do you pass policy that combines um, supporting small businesses that targets low income um, workers to get the skills that they, the, the, to, in, to marriage with uh, education and post-secondary um, attainment. I, I tried to um, work on that a couple of years ago. We, we got it out of the finance commission com, um, a meeting or finance um, committee, but it didn't move forward. Um, but I think now could still be a, a time to hold the line on policies that really support low wage workers. Um, I think that's my, my point. That was one strategy. I think it's still valuable um, and, and we still need policies that target that particular group to um, help them move forward. I don't know that I have a specific answer to that, but a couple of things come to my head. One is I think we need a statewide resource network. So you might have a family who's experiencing instability in Pierce County, let's say in the Tacoma, and they move to federal way. And then they're jumping to a whole nother, let's say, network, whole nother system, right? And we want, I think, is this, this statewide system that no matter where families move, right, that you can have resources that are portable throughout the system. And certainly we were looking for funding for that type of system that would make things a lot more efficient and wouldn't drop families in the transition, as we know that's happening. Is we have cities that don't talk to each other, we have counties that don't talk to each other, right? And we have families that are moving across cities and lines. These families don't see those lines, right? So um, I'm just looking for more flexible funding and a network that will follow families wherever they're at. Well, you know, uh, Mr. Washington, we actually have one. And in, in the mortgage uh, arena, we have the Washington State Home Ownership Center, mm. and the, it's working. And we've had it for quite some time. And on the bottom, and we went through the state legislature for this, on the bottom of every mortgage default or loan or um, foreclosure notice, it says to call the Washington State Hotline. If they could have funding to expand that hotline to do something like that, because th it is working for mm. mortgages and, ta and taxes. Well, it's not really working for the taxes because all of our small counties haven't bought into it to uh, put it on the foreclosures for taxes yet. Mm -hmm. But uh, we did get mortgage companies. It, it, it's the law for mortgage companies to put that on there. And we are, the Urban League is the hot, one, of the, uh, one of their outlets to help people with their mortgages. So it does work. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. So a rent, one for rental, one for just, Resources in general beside 211 would be great. So you're really on to something. This has been a very, very good conversation. Um, and um, my inner circle vernacular, this was juicy. This was really good. Um, thank you everyone for making the time to be here this evening. I typically close this out, but there's one thing I wanna say because there was another question that just came up and it was like, is there a call for um, innovative and creative ideas and where can we send them to? And I don't wanna hold off. I don't wanna say hold on a minute to that because that's, um, that's squelching creativity. So um, I'm just gonna say for now, we'll serve, MDC is willing to serve as the catch-all. You can send your ideas to impact at mdc-hope.org. And Rob, if you will just type that in for all of the um, attendees to see, that would be great. And we will um, just 
catch those ideas. Maybe there's something that's already underway and we can let people know about that, but I want to make certain that there is a place um, where those ideas can come. And, and this is what I want to say in closing. I always, um, in Amanda Westbrook's absence, um, I'm going to go on and say, she always says, Pam, give us something and tuck us in for the night. And so what I want to say um, really is speaking to hope. And I heard threads and elements of it throughout the conversation tonight. 2020 is the year that forces us for all of the busyness we've been caught up in throughout, you know, this time of pandemic is making us think about how we treat one another better. If we don't walk out with that, then shame on us. And we heard how those things can happen. You heard everyone tonight speak to what their concerns are. This is the time for us to figure it out and make certain that we take care of one another. We take care of our neighbor. We take care of our brother. We take care of our sister. So I want to close on that note and thank everyone who made the time to participate. Marilise Hood Kwan, Linda Taylor, Walter Washington, Corbett Moses Lee, and um, as always, my colleague um, and good partner here, Twina Nobles, thank you so much for being here. And of course, Rob Huff, who is our, um, our virtual producer. So everyone, thank you again. Have a good night. Just keep, keep moving forward. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.